Jesus, I would know more of His grace to their show, more of His saving fullness see, more of His love who died for me, more, more about Jesus. Jesus, let me learn more of His holy will this arm. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus in His world, hold in communion with my Lord. Jesus on his throne, reaches in glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming Prince of Peace, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. I'd like to study with you tonight more about our blessed Lord and his work on the cross and in the sanctuary. Now the title of my study this evening is Righteousness by Faith and the Sanctuary. Now one reason I like to uh, announce that title is that many people are interested in righteousness by faith. And if you will allow me to say it, there are many people that don't know a sermon on righteousness by faith unless it's labeled. And then they recognize it. And so I want everybody tonight to get a real blessing in studying righteousness by faith. And tonight we're going to study it in the setting of the sanctuary. Now, recently, we've had a series of uh, lessons on the sanctuary, and this is continuing right on, making it very practical in our daily Christian experience. Let me tell you what righteousness by faith means to me. It means three wonderful things. First, I know that Jesus died for me. I know it by faith. Second, I know that he covers me. He forgives me. And I know that by faith. And third, I know that he cleanses me. And that he's going to keep on that work until he has me ready for heaven, and I know that by faith. And this is righteousness by faith. And the message concerning these wonderful things that Jesus has done, is doing, and will do is given to us in the sanctuary. You remember as we've been studying the sanctuary, that the reason there are these three different places, the court, the holy place, and the most holy place, is simply this, 
There are three great things that Jesus has to do for us. First, he died for us. This is represented by the offering of the lamb, the bullock, the goat, here in the court. And you remember that the animals were never slain within the tabernacle. They were always slain out here in the court. And all those sacrifices pointed to the one great offering of Jesus upon the cross. Every lamb that died. And those sacrifices that were made by Adam and Eve and Abel at the gate of the garden on down through the patriarchal time. And then the thousands of sacrifices in the tabernacle and later in Solomon's temple. Every one of those pointed forward to the Lamb of God who one day would die for me. But that wasn't the end of his work. That's the beginning. And so after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven to carry on his work as our priest within the veil. And what is his work there? Well, as we've studied, his work is intercession and atonement. And as the priest in the ancient service took the blood which had been shed in the court and sprinkled it in the holy place before the veil and upon the horns of the golden altar. So Jesus, by his own blood, entered the sanctuary above after his resurrection, there to plead his blood for penitent sinners and to cover those sins with his own life. And so it is written, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, Psalm 32, 1. And so if my sins are forgiven, they are what? They are covered. They are covered. So first, Jesus must die for me. Then he must enter the sanctuary and present the blood of his cross to cover my sin. I'd like to study that covering with you a little tonight. It isn't just a judicial act in which if I confess a particular sin, that Jesus forgives that particular sin. The truth of the matter is, friends, when we come to God, I was about to say most of us, I'll say all of us, are not conscious of all of our sin. And I'm so thankful tonight for the assurance that Jesus is covering me in the sanctuary above, not only forgiving the sins that I have become conscious of and have confessed, but he is standing between me and justice represented by that law within the ark. He is making up for my deficiency day by day, moment by moment. Now, I can't read your mind, but I know something about my own. I don't know all about it. But I'm very conscious of the fact that I have deficiency. And if I would spend very much time thinking about those deficiencies, they could depress me very much. But it's my privilege, as I see them, to turn my eyes to Jesus in the sanctuary and behold him there holding up his wounded hands for me.
This is the lesson that God tried to teach the children of Israel back there in the desert at the time that the serpents were biting them. You remember that many of the people were dying. Jesus said to Moses, take some brass and make a serpent, put it on a pole and hold it up there. And tell all the people in the camp that if any man has been bitten, he can do what? Look and live. Look and live. And Jesus, in his talk to Nicodemus, referred to that. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 14 and 15. And that's the setting for the oft-repeated John 3, 16, which is almost word-for-word -word repetition of the preceding verse. My point is, Christ on the cross was represented to Israel by that brazen serpent, and they were to do what? Look and live. I want to tell you something, friends. You can't look to him without looking away from yourself. And equally so, you cannot look to yourself and still look to him. And repentance is turning from self to Christ. Merely to go with the head bowed down mourning and grieving over our weakness and inefficiency is not enough. True, we need to sense our weakness. Those people that had been bitten with the serpent, they sensed their weakness, didn't they? Oh, yeah, about to die. They'd been stung with those venomous snakes. But Moses didn't say, keep studying yourself and analyzing yourself and all that. He said, what? Look and live. Whoever will look will live. Now, do you know what it takes to look in a situation like that? It takes faith. That's all it takes, but it takes all of that. Ah, oh, you say, I don't have very much faith. Well, you don't need very much. You just need to use what you have. Now, I'll show you something wonderful about faith. This is very practical in righteousness by faith. I'm going to read it to you from Book 5 of the Commentary, page 1121, one of the Spirit of Prophecy comments. Now listen carefully. You have to talk faith. You have to live faith. You have to act faith that you may have an increase of faith. You want more faith? Well, you'll have to start using what you have. You know, all the diet in the world will never give a man a lot of muscle. Takes food, of course. Dr. Scharfenberg will tell us some more about that tomorrow night, I'm sure. But listen, Fred. He'll also tell you that eating alone won't build muscle. Is that right? What does it take? Exercise. Oh, but somebody says I'm weak. Well, start using what muscle you have. And I know that everybody here, no matter how weak you are, you have some muscle. Am I right? You all have some muscle. And if we'll use what muscles we have, we'll have what? More muscle and stronger. More muscle, power, strong. But we can wish for it. And may I say it reverently, we may even pray for more muscle power. That isn't the way it happens. It's all right to pray about it, but then we are to exercise our what? 
our muscle. And the particular muscle we're studying right now is what? Faith. Righteousness by faith. The Israelites, as they turned from their sick body, turned their eyes away from their symptom and looked where God had told them to look, something happened. It was faith that led them to look. Faith will cause us to look, to look to the Lamb of God dying for us on the altar. Look to the priest within the veil as he sprinkles the, bl the blood and mingles the incense with our prayer. As we look, we live. As we express our faith in him, by looking where he's told us to look, our faith will what? It'll grow. Let me read that again. You have to talk faith. You have to live faith. You have to act faith that you may have an increase of faith. And thus, exercising that living faith, you will grow to strong men and women in Christ Jesus. Now, one of the greatest reasons that I want to have this little study with you tonight is this, friend. The devil doesn't play fair. He doesn't play fair at all. And when somebody exercises the God-given right that God has given every man and woman to make a choice to serve God instead of the devil, then the devil begins a dishonest program of trying to make that person feel guilty and gone and lost and defeated and all that sort of business. He may be operating on some of you. He works on me. But you know where my help comes? It comes from looking from self to Christ. Looking from self to Christ. And may I tell you one of the greatest reasons God gave us the sanctuary service, all worked out here on earth, is this. He wanted us to have some tangible objects that our imagination might fix upon, focus upon. It's hard to deal with that which is entirely intangible. We need something that we can visualize. You know, I hear people ridicule the idea of a real sanctuary in heaven. Well, friends, I believe there's a real sanctuary in heaven. And the cynic and the critic, they will begin to ask, well, now, do you believe it's this way? Do you believe it's this way? Do you believe it's this way? Do you really believe this and this and this and this? You know, friends, my faith is very simple, childlike on this point. Some people might think it's childish. That's all right. And this is my answer. If this isn't the way it is, this is the way God wanted us to think about it anyway, because this is the picture he's given. That's it. You read it in early writing. As God showed his messenger in these last days, things in heaven, did he show a real sanctuary? Was there a veil there? Did she go in? Did she see the candlestick and the table and the altar? And then there, was there another veil open? What did she see in there? Ark. Was the ark open? Anything in it? Yes. The law is in there and all the rest. My point is, this is the way the Bible presents it. 
when God had Moses build his sanctuary. He called him up there into the top of that Mount Sinai and showed him the whole pattern. It wasn't just some blueprints. He showed him the heavenly sanctuary. Paul says that in Hebrews 8 chapter. Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Paul says in Hebrews 8, 4, and 5, that that was, was a representation of the work that Jesus was doing in heaven after he went back there. That's what he says in the first two verses. We have an high priest there in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Is it really a true tabernacle? Is it there? Well, if it isn't, friends, what is all this talking about anyway? I believe it. Don't you? Yeah. And my point is this. I realize that my poor little mind is not big enough to grasp all the beauty and the glory and the size of that marvelous temple. But just because I can't get all there is there doesn't keep me from getting all I can. Wouldn't it be a shame for a person who came to a nice picnic with the table just loaded with good food, nice salads and sandwiches and all the rest, to look at it and say, oh my, I know I can never eat all this, so I'm just going home. What a shame. I know I can't embrace in my tiny mind all that's there, but friends, I want to get what Jesus has planned for me to get. And he says, look there. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 3, 1. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Oh, yes, friend. And what's he doing there? He's in the business of covering sin. That's what the priest did back there in that service. Paul says that was the example and shadow of heavenly things. Yes, Jesus is in the business of covering sin. He's covering my sin, covering my sin. And he's covered the sins that I've confessed to him. Praise his name. And he's also making up my deficiencies about a lot of things that I may not know about. This is my assurance. I am accepted in the beloved. That's what the Bible says. That's what righteousness by faith means. And that's what the sprinkled blood means. It means that my life is covered by his life. Isn't that good? Amen. Now listen. The devil's idea in trying to get you to miss that blessing is to say, yes, that's all right, and that's all fine. And if you could only meet the conditions, it's all for you. But the trouble is you don't meet the conditions. This is the devil talking, you understand. Did he ever talk that way to you? Why, of course he has. If he hasn't, he will, so you better get notes on it. That's right. Have your shield ready. And the shield is the shield of what? Faith. Many feel they lack faith, so they remain away. Do you know what the angel said? Faith is so simple. You look above it. Many tried too hard to believe. Faith is so simple. You look above it. Now, there's some things, friends, that we don't reach high enough and far enough for. But in this matter of faith, some people try so hard, they get beyond it. They don't get it. 
Faith is not something difficult. Faith is simple. Do you know what faith is? Let me tell you something. I think I have something on it here. Oh, yes. Volume 1, 620. Said the angel, feeling is not faith. Faith is simply to take God at his word. Feeling is not faith. Faith is simply to take God at his word. Let me illustrate. Suppose somebody here tonight that doesn't have very much money. Suppose you've got a $50 bill that you've got to take care of next Monday. And you've only got a few pieces of money jingling around in your pocket, less than a dollar altogether. You've got a $50 account. You've got to settle money. And it's important. And you know you've got to do it. You might be concerned about it. Now tell me, and just be honest, suppose that I were to say to you tonight, I'll take care of that. I'll have that $50 for you Monday morning. Would you believe me? Would you? Or would you lie awake all night, and tomorrow night, and Sunday night, thinking, oh my, I wonder what in the world I'm going to do about that account I have to settle Monday morning. What am I going to do? And somebody who had heard this might say, well, I thought, I thought you had that all taken care of. Didn't somebody tell you they were going to give you that money and pay it for you Monday morning? Well, yes, I know. I, I heard that. I've heard things before, but I... I honestly believe, friend, that most of you, at least, if I promised you that, you'd go to sleep and rest. I think you'd believe me. You notice I said $50. I didn't say $5 million. I wouldn't expect you to believe me if I promised you five million or even five thousand. But I think I know where I could get fifty dollars if you had to have it. And I think you'd believe me if I promised you that. Wouldn't you? Now my point is this, friends. Something might happen that I couldn't do it. I might die between now and Monday morning. But the word of the living God is this. If we confess, let's say it all together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, I bring my sins and I confess them to Jesus. I put them on the lamp. I see him die for me upon the cross. I see him plead his precious blood in the sanctuary above, and I know my sins are covered. How do I know it? Because he promised. He is faithful that promised. Turn to Hebrews 10. I want you to see that. We were looking at it in our recent study, but I want you to see it again. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Did he say he'd forgive us if we'd come? Did he say his precious blood would cover us? What are the conditions? just to come and give ourselves to him and to believe. To believe. This is part of the condition. Now may I tell you, Fred, many people are waiting to see some or hear some. 
or feel something before they believe. It's the other way around. Believing is part of the condition. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 1. The man who came to the sanctuary back there with his lamb, he showed his faith by bringing the lamb, by confessing his sin, by slaying the sacrifice and watching as the priest performed his part of the service. This was all an expression of what? Faith. Let me tell you, friends, every time you and I look away from ourselves to our great high priest in heaven, we are exercising faith, and as, don't miss this, as it is faith that leads us to look to him, the expression of faith increases the faith which we exercise, just like our muscles. So, God wants you to say, I believe. He wants you to say, Lord, I know you keep your word. I know you've taken my seat. I know you're covering my division. I have no doubt about it. I believe you with all my heart. Now, you remember that the last thing the high priest did in the sanctuary was on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Then he took the sins out and put them on the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was led off into the desert. That was the end. And what does that mean to me tonight in righteousness by faith? It means, and don't miss this, it means that as I look at Jesus, my great high priest, as he stands there in the most holy place, I know he's going to finish what he started. I know he's going to finish what he started. And dear friends, he started it with me. He died for me. He covers my sins. And he's going to blot out my sins. I know he's going to do it. That's what he died for. That's what he went in the sanctuary for. He's going to stay there, my dear friends, till he gets it done. Ah, oh, you say, how do you know that you're going to be worthy? Well, my dear friends, he's the one that's worthy. It's truth that if somewhere along the line I get rebellious and stubborn and pull away from him, it's true that he won't be able to accomplish the work in me. But by God's grace, I intend to let him keep doing what he started. And as long as I continue to choose that, he's going to get it done. One of the saddest things about some of the present agitation on all the whys and wherefores and ifs and ands and buts about this final work is this, friend. It gets people to thinking that they've got to understand all about that in order to receive it. And nothing could be further from the truth. There are some things that Jesus wants us to understand about his work in the most holy place. But, Fray, the things he wants us to understand, he's made as clear as noonday sun. You can read them there in great controversy, the chapter, What is the Sanctuary and the Holy of Holies and the Investigative Judgment? Wonderful chapters. We don't need some mysterious... theories that will tell us a great many things that we never knew before of just how that's all going to get done up here in our mind. No, no, that isn't what we need. We need to look to Jesus on the cross, in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, and believe that as we look at what he's doing, he will accomplish his work.
you know, people who study the digestion of foods, they find some wonderful marvels as bread and milk and beans and potatoes are taken through the mouth, the stomach, the intestine, digested, become a part of the bloodstream in the body. Wonderful process. And there are people who can tell us quite a bit about how that's done. But you know, the wisest of them admit that there are mysteries there that cannot be fully explained. Wouldn't it be a sad thing if your digestion depended on your being able to understand all those mysteries? Wouldn't it? How many of us would be here tonight? May I see your hands? One girl started putting her hand up, but she thought better of it and put it down. Not a soul. Don't miss this. We are all here tonight because the dear Lord did something for us in eating that we didn't understand when it was happening. Do you agree? I wonder if he could do that in our stomachs, if he could do it in our mind. What do you think? Oh, yes. And the truth of the matter is, if you and I had waited till we understood all about eating and digestion before we ate, we wouldn't be here, would we? No, no. But don't miss this, friends. Although we can have nutrition, even if we don't understand all the mysteries of digestion, we can't have nutrition if we don't eat. Do you agree with me on that? You mean I need to eat even if I don't understand all the processes of digestion? Oh, yeah. It's all right to study about digestion. Let's learn all we can. But friends, let's remember that the life comes. Oh, don't miss this. The life comes not in understanding all the processes of digestion, but in eating. That's where the life comes. And the life in the sanctuary, the life in righteousness by faith, does not come through an ability to make some intricate explanation of how it's all going to be brought about. If you want something interesting, look in Selected Messages, that chapter on the peril of extreme views. Read that letter that the servant of the Lord wrote to a minister who had tried to figure out all about the mystery of godliness, and she said it's just as much a mystery after you get through your explanations as it was before. That was really picking the balloon, wasn't it? And she told it. She said, your mind has become unbalanced in trying very hard to figure out these mysteries and figuring out just exactly the condition that people must get into so they don't sin anymore. She says, you have no such work to do. She urged him to lead his people in simple language to Jesus upon the cross and help them to behold the just dying for the unjust, and let God, the great physician, deal with human hearts. Oh, friends, I would not discourage the study of the word, but I would plead with your heart. Remember, Jesus has made this so simple that every one of us can understand enough to be saved. And I long for us to present the gospel in a simple way. And here it is. Jesus died for me. I know it. I know it by faith. He said so, and I believe his word. Jesus covers my sins when I confess them. I believe it. He says so, and I believe his word. And in the final work in the most holy place, he's going to blot out all those sins forever. And that means that he's going to 
by that time, get me to the point where it'll be safe for him to close the sanctuary and come and take me home. I believe he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. How do I know it? By faith. Remember that definition I read you? Volume 1, 620, said the angel. Feeling is not faith. Faith is simply to take God at his word. Now, in our last study on this subject, I gave you a text in Philippians 1, 6. I wish you'd turn back to it. What's the second word? Confident. What does that mean? Sure. Certain. All right. Together. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And as you know, the margin says he'll finish it. You remember in Paul's letter to the Hebrews, 12th chapter, he says, looking unto Jesus, the what? Author and the finisher of our faith. See, he's the author. He laid the foundation of the plan of salvation when upon the cross he gave his life as the sacrificial lamb. He's been carrying it on now all these decades and centuries within the veil. Soon he's going to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat in the final atonement, blotting out sin forever. He's going to abolish sin, make an end of sin. Do you believe it, friend? Is he going to do it for you? How do you know it? By faith. And faith is not what? Faith is not feeling. No. Faith is simply to take God at his word. No. I want you to look again at that diagram of the 2300 days. Have you got some good, solid mathematical evidence as you look at that, that Jesus came on time and died on time? That's right. Fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. 500 years before Christ was born into this world, the angel Gabriel pointed out just when he'd come, when he'd die. He died according to the time, as Paul said. But now watch this. I can believe and know that Jesus came and that he died. Those are historical facts. But you know how I know he died for me? That's a matter of faith. I just believe his word. All the mathematics in the world won't take the place of faith. My faith is built upon the mathematical evidence and demonstration of this wonderful prophecy. But listen, it's more than believing that Jesus is the Messiah. It's more than believing that he died for the world. He loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Can you say that? Let's say it together. He loved me and gave himself for me. Did he do it for you? Do you believe it? Well, that's faith. Faith says, Lord, I believe it. If you say you did it for me, then I believe you did it for me. That's the way you know it. It's just because he says so. God who cannot lie, who has promised. And watch this, as you believe by faith that he died for you, so you believe by faith that as you give yourself to him, he covers you. Turn to Romans, the fourth chapter. I want your faith to be built upon the word of God. Romans 4. Third verse. But what saith the scripture? Abraham did what? Believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
How did Abraham get righteousness? He believed God. All right. Sixth verse. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying altogether, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Are your sins covered? Well, if you confess your sins, you're covered, pray. That's what he says. But what did Abraham have to do to get all that wonderful experience? He had to what? He had to believe. That's what you'll have to do. Will you believe God? Oh, but somebody says, I don't know whether I've confessed all my sins. Well, just confess the ones you know about. That's all you can confess. Come now, pray. Do you know any way to confess something you don't know anything about? Do you see how the devil tries to bother poor souls? Worry them, weary them. Oh, maybe I did something 10 years ago that I've forgotten all about. Oh, away with the worries. Jesus hasn't made the path to heaven hard. Just confess the ones that he brings to your mind. That's all. You're not dealing with a computer. You're dealing with a friend, somebody who loved you enough to die for you. Oh, he loves you, friend. He's giving his whole life for you in the sanctuary tonight. Thank God for his wonderful love. And then the devil bothers other people with the thought, yes, I know, you've started. But how do you know you're going to just put everything you have into this thing, you're going to try and try, and then you're not going to make it. You're just not going to make it. You've been trying for a year, two years, so on and on, and how much progress do you make? How do you know you're going to get through before probation closes? How do you know you're not going to stand there knocking at the door when the door is closed? Listen, pray. Being confident, we read it a few minutes ago. Being what? Confident of this very thing. I like the way Paul puts it. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will, will finish it. Tell me, friend. How many of you folks believe that God has done something for you? May I see your hand? Do you really believe he's done something for you? Well... This says that he which hath begun a good work in you will what? Finish it. finish it. Wouldn't you finish something you started if you could? Yeah. Yeah. Any of you folks any of you folks cook anything today? How many of you folks cook something today? Yeah. Well, did you finish it? Did you? Oh well I think you did. You were baking? You kept looking at the oven, and at the right time, you opened the door, and there it was what? Finished. It was, what's that little word of one syllable we use? It was done. God's going to get you done. For it. Just stay in the oven with him. Just stay in the oven with him. Don't doubt it. It's this doubting and wavering that delays the work of God. Every morning, get up and say, Dear Lord, I'm giving myself to you again today. I know you're going to take me farther up the road today. I know you're going to keep working in my heart. And I know you're keeping me covered all the time. So if anything were to happen to me, if I were to die, I know my case is in your hands. I know I'm safe, safe in the arms of Jesus. I'm sure there's a lot of things I don't understand yet, but as I keep studying and praying, you're going to reveal himself to me. Oh, but somebody says, this is all fine, but what do you do when you fall? Bless your heart, what do you do when you fall? What do you do when you fall? Is there one thing to do when you fall physically and an entirely different thing to do when you fall spiritually? Not so far. 
The same thing you do when you fall physically is the thing you do when you fall spiritually. And what did you say that was? Get up and go on. Is Jesus there ready to help you? Ah, yes. Well, I hope this little study on righteousness by faith in the sanctuary has helped somebody tonight. If it has, I wish you'd come up here and tell the audience so. Come up and express your faith and your confidence if you've gotten some help tonight. And why am I having you do this? One reason, of course, is to help somebody else, but another reason to help you, because what did I show you tonight? If we'll take what faith we have and express it, what'll happen? It'll grow.
snow.